was not red. I experienced it, being deprived, being oppressed, even confused. It's enough now, we're taking the power back. We're stronger than before, we're proud, proud, and too strong. The worst is over. Uh, good afternoon and welcome back to the Azapo Online Political Education Platform. This is where we educate for liberation. Uh, my name is Simpuya Ashe. <clears throat> Today I'm playing host to comrades uh, Naeem uh, Jina and comrade Nazim Adam. Uh, the discussion topic uh, this afternoon is focusing on the conflict in the Palestine. And um, we have uh, themed uh, this as a um, discussion around the Palestinian revolution, blood, martyrdom towards the land reconquest. And uh, welcome to this platform, comrades. Thank you, Komreshi. Great to be with yeah. you guys in the Zappo today. And uh, thank you. Thank you for um, accepting our invite. And just a bit of background uh, on the two uh, comrades I'm hosting today. And I am Gina is uh, the executive director of the Afro Middle East Center in Johannesburg and also playing a role as a member of the advisory board of the World Congress for Middle East Studies. Uh, the deputy chair of the Dance Heli Peace Institute, as well as um, an advisory board member of the Center for China Africa Studies. He is, of course, a well known political commentator. He has also been involved in anti-capitalist, anti-war and solidarity movements in South Africa. He um, has an MA from Vets University where he also lectured in political studies. Naeem has uh, numerous publications to his name. His most recent being um, Political Islam, conceptualizing power between Islamic states and Muslim social movements. His other publications um, include Pretending Democracy, Israel, an Ethnocratic State, and the PLO uh, Voices from Within. Uh, welcome, Kumwit Naeem. Uh, <clears throat> Nazim Adam is a human rights and anti apartheid activist from his youth. And, uh, you know, those uh, who hail from Indonesia would know that uh, he has been involved in the Venetia uh, Students' Congress as well as the Youth League activities there. He has served as an office bearer of the South African Democratic Teachers Union. Uh, and of course, he's a teacher by profession and the principal now. He currently is a coordinator of the Palestinian Solidarity Alliance, the PSA, which is part of the uh, SABDS coalition and affiliate of the international BDS movement and BDS being the boycott, divestment and sanctions uh, movement. Uh, welcome once more, comrade uh, Nassim. Now, um, as I indicated, the focus of discussion today is really about, um, you know, the conflict in, in the Palestine. Um, you would have seen in uh, the recent uh, past um, a lot of uh, rockets flying, uh, you know, from either Israel or, or the Palestine, and there was a lot of fire being exchanged um, when, uh, you know, the Palestinians were busy with attending to their religious um, activities and out of nowhere we saw rockets flying you know from uh, from israel into palestine and um, and then there was also a retaliation of fire you know by the hamas uh, in 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 retaliation to what was happening at the time so we thought it is prudent for us to really understand and unpack the issues around what is going on in the Palestinian territory. And uh, Nazim and uh, Nahim are going to help us unpack this. 
And maybe uh, just for a start, um, Nazim, if you can just give us a historical context to uh, the conflict uh, in the Palestine, that would help us, uh, you know, start the conversation. Thank you, Congress Beer. So, um, firstly, I'll start just with um, uh, a basic geography in terms of where Palestinian people find themselves. Uh, and then I'll go back and see where this uh, emanated from. So at the moment, we need to understand that the Palestinian people are divided between those who are within the 1948 United Nations borders of Israel. Um, they are considered by Israel as uh, Israeli Arabs, um, and they have a particular experience uh, under apartheid within uh, is, uh, 48 Israel. Then we have a number of Palestinian people and villages who find themselves in the post-1967 uh, occupation of the West Bank and East Jerusalem by uh, the Zionist forces. So they are an occupied uh, people in terms of international law. And then we have a group of Palestinians who are in the Gaza Strip, uh, the south of, uh, of, of, of Palestine, in a totally besieged enclave, uh, no access or exit without Israeli and uh, uh, Israeli stooges, the, the um, CC government of, of Egypt. Uh, so they are in a, in a basically a kind of medieval siege within the Gaza Strip, no entry, no exit. And then obviously there's also a number of Palestinian people who are refugees in neighboring countries, forced out in 1948 um, and in subsequent years, uh, and many that live across the diaspora of the world. So Palestinian people uh, have unique uh, experiences, uh, but all related to uh, the, the occupation and the theft of their land uh, and the dis uh, dispossession of the, 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 the basic human rights. But to track this, we need to understand that Palestine has a history that goes back 10,000 years before Christ. Uh, it's an ancient civilization that, that, it, that it existed there. And over many years, it's been, uh, it's been an area of conflict uh, and, and, and dominance by different forces, like most places in the world. And there would be, have been a period where it was conquer, uh, the ancient empires, the Roman Empire and so forth would have dominated. We know the story of, uh, well, and then obviously with Christianity, there was a period of dominance and then uh, the conquest uh, uh, by the Islamic movement when that took place uh, uh, post the, uh, the, the, the prophet of, of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we had the Crusades. So there's an ancient history that goes back, the Ottomans as well. But I want to speak more in terms of recent history. And that would be from the time of the emergence of nationalism, uh, uh, late 1800s uh, and the past century. Uh, it's in this period uh, of colonial colonialism that we find the, uh, the roots of the current uh, conflict, uh, well, the current occupation, the current uh, freedom struggle of the Palestinian people. And we need to be careful with our words as well, and, and I'll be guarded by that. Um, so the nationalist movement obviously created the idea of creating nation states. And amongst them was a small, tiny group of, of Jewish people in Europe uh, led by Theodor Herzl, and they wanted to define a space for Jewish uh, for Jewish people only, and that is the birth of Zionism. I must say that up front, if you look at the history and look at the original source documents, most Jewish people oppose the idea of Zionism. They found it, and many still do find it, uh, the antithesis of what Judaism is about. Uh, so the guy, idea of the Jewish people having a national movement or a nation state as such is not supported uh, by many people and was not at the time. But it was also in that period that the world witnessed two wars, and we saw that uh, between Britain and France, uh, uh, the colonial powers at the time, 
uh, through Lord Balfour and to the, 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 the now infamous Sykes-Pickett agreement, decided to divide the Middle East up. And, and they maybe will be able to speak more about that because it's, it's more geopolitical. But in terms of that, ma the mandate for the governance of Palestine was given to Britain. So um, we see that during World War II and the atrocities of Nazi Germany um, and the Holocaust that, that, that the Jewish people experienced, the, uh, Britain had the mandate over this place. But while they had this mandate, a very active Zionist movement was pushing towards occupying more and more of Palestine and settling more and more European Jews in, in, the, in the Holy Land. In fact, uh, this is what led to the initial Nakba, the catastrophe that the Palestinians speak of, which happened in 1948. In 1948, the United Nations was established and they said, look, there's, there's Jewish people, they want the land, there's Palestinian people that are living there, what do we do? And there were only 33 nations, predominantly European, that were part of the United Nations at the time, and they decided to split the Palestinian people and their land into into not even equal halves. Uh, and uh, there's those famous three maps that you see of Palestine and how it's divided and, and where it sits now. And, 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 and that's why the geographical understanding is so important. At this point, obviously, um, uh, there was some resistance. There was a uh, from the Pal uh, Palestinian people, from neighboring Arab people. But what was happening and what was hidden from the world's view was a major, major series of massacres. Entire villages, entire populations of towns and villages exterminated uh, in an ethnic cleansing uh, clearance of Palestinian land and territory to make way for Jewish settlement. So we'll find close to 750,000 Palestinian people were uh, evicted, were, were expelled from their land, expelled from their homes. Some were internally displaced, some were then left as refugees in neighboring countries and so forth. So if you want to understand what is happening currently in Palestine, you need to understand that that is that kind of uh, ethnic cleansing started back, way back in 1948 and it continues today. Um, from there, obviously, we had a number of um, uh, flare-ups or uh, resistance. We see that the emergence of movements on the ground, liberation movements like the PLO, Fatah, the PFLP, um, and each of these uh, liberation movements uh, took the struggle uh, to the Zionists, to the now settler colonial state of Israel uh, in different forms. What was significant was that uh, there was also a general uprising from the ordinary Palestinian folk, and, and that would have been the initial intifada, which means uprising, and that was late 80s, uh, which led to huge, huge shifts in, in the way the Palestinian people were seen and the way the struggle was, was conceptualized. Unfortunately and sadly, amongst this was also a, some, some huge mistakes. So the acceptance of the Oslo and all these kind of peace agreements without uh, real uh, solutions long term and immediate has led to further subjugation of the Palestinian people uh, in a way that that leadership has let them down. So now you have a Palestinian authority that is meant to govern over Palestinian spaces, but they have no power, no power to stop Israel from establishing Jewish settlements in those spaces, no power over, uh, over, over, the, over their finances, or over their road networks, their people are now into cantons and, and divided by an apartheid wall. And the situation for the Palestinian people is worsening by the hour. Um, it's, and that leads us to the current context where we find ourselves now in terms of uh, people resisting in what is a new intifada, uh, a, a new uprising, uh, because people on the ground and youth activists in particular in this age of digital uh, activism are taking uh, taking on the uh, apartheid Israeli state in ways that have not been taken before. And we see that there's huge efforts from the Israeli um, uh, uh, 
uh, counter efforts from them to silence people, especially on social media and so forth. The fact that we have this opposition uh, from the ground in Sheikh Jarrah, which is uh, actually a neighborhood in, in Jerusalem, most of the inhabitants of Sheikh Jarrah would have been previously displaced people from the original Nakba from 1948. So they're living here for decades in this place, uh, forced because of the aggression of Zionist forces. And now under the guise of a very um, uh, loaded legal system, loaded in, in favor of Jewish uh, citizens of Israel and uh, against the rights of Palestinians, are trying to, uh, and they say evict, but it's forcibly remove people. And, and we can, as uh, South Africans, identify with that because that is what many South Africans experienced uh, and unfortunately may also still be experiencing. And we need to stand together with these activists and with these families in and there's another region uh silwan that has come out this week of another 80 families that are also facing this kind of eviction uh or uh, uh forced removals from their homes um there's lots of social media about how Jewish settlers have every right to just walk into uh, Palestinian homes. We saw this happen in Shuhada Street, in Bethlehem, in, in, in Al Khalil, in Hebron. We, and it is a, a, a continuous and systematic approach from the Zionist forces and settlers to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to ethnically cleanse all of Palestine, and in this case, particularly Jerusalem, of any kind of Palestinian uh, heritage or citizenship. So when that happened, we also saw that uh, there was uh, resistance uh, from, from those people, but another major international uh, criminal uh, activity was the blatant attack of uh, of people praying in the Masjid al-Aqsa uh, during the holy month of Ramadan, running in with the, the stormtrooper boots and tear gas and the violence that they inflicted on, on people who were, were praying. Uh, this is a great human rights violation and obviously uh, stirred huge emotions across the globe, particularly for people who value human rights, uh, Muslim people, Christian people as well. and and. Uh, we, while that made headlines a week before that, the Christian churches were were were, were victim of this violence in in Jerusalem, and and there's a long history of Christianity in 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 Palestine and in Jerusalem in particular. So, th this is a deliberate move to Judaize uh, Jerusalem and cleanse it of all other religious people and citizens. And the final one was that we know for the last year. Um, the people of Gaza trapped in this enclave uh, under siege have been part of a great return march going to the borders, going to the fences, protesting the, the occupation of the, the, the siege on top of them, not being able to get basic necessities, not being able to get access to, uh, to testing for COVID-19 and never mind vaccinations and all of the, uh, the, the other kind of basic food items that people need to survive. <laughs> And even building materials uh, once, and they were bombed from 2008 on a periodic period. Um, we just saw the worst of it in the last few days. Uh, and uh, what what gave strength to people, and and it's amazing, people. There were families and uh, and nearly what was it, 63 children that were killed in all of this, and the the, re the resilience of the Palestinian people, and uh, to support the resistance because they know that it's only by defeating the apartheid state that they will achieve their freedom, justice, dignity, uh, and equality. Uh, and that is why it is important that we, we, we speak about it, educate ourselves, and, and uh, begin to build a movement uh, that supports the struggle of, uh, of occupied people and oppressed people across the globe. Thanks uh, for that um, historical background, Comrade Nazim. I think it was, um, you know, important that we get context to, you know, where we come from with this struggle and what has been happening, and why we are where we are. And uh, I think, uh, Comrade Naim, it's, it's important to understand the geopolitical situation uh, in, in, more especially in that region. And if you can just help us understand what are the dynamics and what is, you know, the real geopolitical situation happening. 
uh, that is impacting on you know all issues and uh, leading to the new intifada that we are seeing now. Thank you, Comrade Simpira. Um, um, two or three things that I want to speak about, but let me start by by reminding people the, the many lessons that I think we and Palestinians um, have learned or can learn from the past few weeks. One of them, I think, will sound very familiar to, to many of us. Um, I'm sure many of us have seen that, uh, that video, which has gone viral and in a sense is iconic, um, of this young Palestinian woman, Muna al-Kurd, uh, talking to the settler, uh, Yaqub. Um, and, um, and, and, and Yaqub's response to her when she says, don't steal our house, um, I think is something that all colonized people understand. This is one man, but what he says actually reflects what colonization was about. He says, if I don't steal it, someone else will, talking about the house. Let me just make a point about, uh, about Yaqub and Muna and the relationship between the two. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, Yaqub and his family moved into Muna's house. Um, Muna was about 16 years old at the time and took over half the house. Literally, they just took over half the house. This is the reason why Muna knows Yaqub's name, because in a sense, they are, I hate to use the, 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 this kind of word, but they are neighbors. Uh, Yaqub occupies half of her house and now wants to take over the rest of the house. This is the, the, the background of, of that story. So what we are seeing, uh, what we saw in the past few weeks uh, taking place in, uh, in Palestine is a resistance against um, this form of colonialism, but also resistance against uh, occupation and a resistance against apartheid. And I want to break that down. And those three terms, by the way, um, about 10 years ago, nine years ago, the Human Sciences Research Council came out with a um, huge report, um, close to 200 page report, which, uh, which concluded a report drawn up by um, international uh, by, by experts in international law, which concluded that Israel was guilty of occupation, colonialism and apartheid. And I think it's a good kind of reference point for us uh, to, to look at these. Now, when I say that the, the resistance in the past few weeks has been against these three, let's, let's look at what were the fronts that opened up um, in, in the past few weeks uh, from, um, uh, um, from about a month ago. Um, you had the first front that opened up was that in Jerusalem, where the very typical kind of colonial project of forced removals of people from their homes. Um, and uh, Nazim spoke about this, you know, how these people, Munaz family, for example, was removed from their homes in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Haifa uh, 70 years ago. And they ended up uh, in, in East Jerusalem or Eastern part of Jerusalem. Uh, and now, you know, there's an attempt to move them again. So in Jerusalem, you had this, this battle against uh, colonialism. And by the way, Jerusalem is under international law, um, um, uh, is, is occupied by Israel illegally. Um, the Palestinian citizens in Jerusalem or Palestinians in Jerusalem, because they have no citizenship whatsoever. Palestinians in Jerusalem are not given citizenship by anyone. They are given residency by, uh, by Israel. And if they, for example, work in the West Bank, um, then they could lose their residency because Israel says that they spend more time in the West Bank than in Jerusalem. If a student goes out of the country to study in, in South Africa um, and is out of Jerusalem too long, um, he or she might lose their residency because, uh, because they, they are out for too long. So they're in a very precarious position. Um, they're also not allowed, uh, uh, a whole complex uh, of laws, not allowed to build, not allowed to extend their homes, uh, all of those kinds of things. So the objective in Jerusalem is very clearly uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. So that, that's part of the colonial project. Um, the other two fronts that we saw uh, in, in, you know, in, over the past month was, of course, Gaza. Um, Gaza is under international law, even though Israelis say that they are not in Gaza. Under international law, the fact that the territory is completely controlled by Israel means that it remains under occupation. Um, and Gaza responded in, in support of the people of Jerusalem. And then the West Bank, 
um, has something called a Palestinian authority, but in fact, this Palestinian authority headed by Mahmoud Abbas has less power, less independence, um, less sovereignty, if we can use such a term, um, than Baputatswana or Transkai had in the old days in South Africa. It's less than a Bantustan, but it's called a state. Uh, so it still is under occupation. And we saw people rising up in, uh, in the West Bank as well um, against the Israelis after the uh, assault began on Gaza. And the fourth front in this resistance over the past month um, was something that was almost entirely new. And that is within what is called Israel, what Palestinians refer to as the 48 territories. Um, within Israel, Palestinians rose up uh, in a way that they haven't done before. They broke this barrier of fear that they had. Um, we found uh, burning barricades in, in the middle of cities in, uh, uh, in Israel. Uh, we found um, Zionist gangs uh, attacking Palestinians, etc. And what we see in Israel is a good example of, uh, of a resistance to apartheid. Because uh, within Israel itself, despite whatever uh, Israeli apologists would say, there's a system of apartheid, there is an equality, and Palestinians make up 20% of that population. So we saw this resistance taking place on these four fronts um, within, um, within, within the Palestinian context just over the past uh, four months, uh, just over the, 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 the past month. Um, now, let me make this point that we all remember, of course, those of us who are South African, that in terms of the South African context, um, you know, those who, who call on Palestinians, even those who pretend to be supporters of the Palestinians or actually believe that they are, often call on Palestinians to, um, uh, to use uh, so-called peaceful means of struggle against the, uh, against the colonial uh, Israeli state. Uh, we remember that in South Africa, of course, international solidarity was a very important part um, of the struggle against apartheid. But uh, 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 another important and perhaps more important part of the struggle against apartheid, some of us would argue more important, was uh, internal resistance within uh, South Africa against the apartheid state. I mean, we would all remember um, and I see lots of uh, lots of comrades, lots of names in the list of participants here, who are comrades uh, that that I haven't spoken to in many years. So I know when I say we will remember that they do remember. We will remember that by the late eighties, there were parts of our country that were not just ungovernable, but were no go zones um, for for the SADF. This wasn't because of international solidarity. This was because of our struggle within the country. Um, and so Palestinians, of course, they have the right under international law to resist colonialism um, and, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of the Geneva Conventions. Um, but Palestinians have taken up that right uh, in different ways. And of course, we support the right of Palestinians to resist. Um, and so we saw in these four different uh, areas over the past month that this resistance took different forms. From Gaza, it was in the form of uh, a kind of armed struggle. Um, in other places, it, it, it was, it was uh, different forms. Now we can, we can discuss um, in, in the discussion, uh, the pros and cons of these things, uh, if, if we want, but I'm just pointing uh, these out. For Palestinians, what happened in the past month is in many ways a kind of uh, victory. They were able to keep the Israelis out of Gaza um, and force them into a ceasefire within 10 days, 11 days, on the 11th day it stopped. Um, they uh, created a sense of unity among Palestinians uh, over the past month that has not been seen before. They made uh, the creations of the Oslo Accords from the early 90s irrelevant. The Palestinian Authority had no role um, no relevance, no importance, no one cared to ask them what they thought, uh, and they only said what they thought a uh, few days into the, the assault uh, on, on Gaza. And so for many reasons, uh, again, we can discuss this further, Palestinians regard the past month as really as, uh, as a victory. Um, and the fact that Palestinians rose up as they did uh, in the 48 areas within Israel um, is a, uh, for, for them, a, a huge victory. Now, let me make one or two other points about, um, uh, about this issue uh, before coming to an end. One is that, you know, I, we, we spoke, both Nazim and I, about Sheikh Jarrah. Um, 
Sheikh Jarrah is not, well, firstly, of course, it's not something that happened a month ago. Um, as I said earlier on, Muna's half her home was taken over by, by Yaqub the settler 10 years ago. Uh, and this is on the basis of a law, an Israeli law from 1970, that basically says that uh, Jewish settlers in, in Jerusalem can, uh, can identify a Palestinian home and decide that it's theirs and take it over. So this court case that's coming up about the houses in Sheikh Jarrah, the court case has been launched by the settlers, not by the Palestinians, launched by the settlers because these you know, bloody stubborn Palestinians refused to move out of their homes after the settlers decided that they wanted the homes. So they've launched a court case to get rid of the, the Palestinians uh, from their homes. But it's not just uh, a continuation of what has been happening for decades in Sheikh Jarrah or Silwan or in Jerusalem itself. In 1947, when the United Nations, at the time, of course, composed largely of colonial powers, um, when the United Nations decided to split Palestine, 55% uh, as a Jewish state, as they called it, and 45% as an Arab state, as they called it, at that time, the population in Palestine was only 30% Jewish. And that 30% was accumulated over the past half a century in the main. Uh, and particularly uh, uh, during the Second World War. 30% um, of the population was Jewish as a result of uh, British facilitating their immigration into Palestine over the past half century. And they owned 7% of the land uh, of Palestine. Yet the United Nations in its grand wisdom uh, split it 55%, the majority of, of the territory for, for Jews. And of course, Palestinians were never consulted in that. <clears throat> from the time that uh, 1967 that Jerusalem was taken over and particularly after it was illegally annexed in 1981 um, the, the clamping down on, on the rights of Palestinians of course was, was great but particularly on the issue of land and property um, the, as I said earlier there's a whole web of laws that uh, ensures that, that it is impossible for Palestinians in Jerusalem to build, to extend their homes, etc., And if they do so, then their homes get destroyed. Um, there was a study a few years, about 10 years ago, um, that showed that of the, uh, um, the, the large number, or the number, not large number, the number of uh, martyrdom bombers, so-called suicide bombers, Palestinian suicide bombers, um, that about 55% of them had their homes destroyed by, uh, by Israeli forces. Um, the destruction of a home and taking over of, of your land, uh, well, I think many Africans, uh, we can understand that quite well. Um, but this is, this is uh, you know, part of the fundamental issue uh, there. Um, now, let me make a point that colonialism, of course, as we, as we know, um, colonialism doesn't exist uh, in a country on its own. Um, colonialism is not a domestic issue uh, uh, as such, but it is uh, enabled and facilitated by global support or by, by, by international support. And so in the case of Israel as well. What is that international support? Of course, um, you know, there's a web of, of, of uh, cooperation with the Israeli uh, apartheid and colonial state. Uh, at the forefront of that is the United States. The United States provides uh, Israel with about $4 billion a year just on military aid. Um, just on military aid. That's apart from all the other forms of aid that it might be giving uh, <clears throat> uh, to Israel. $4 billion a year. But it also is very diligent that in the Security Council, virtually any resolution that comes up that is critical of Israel, it would veto. Uh, of course, we do have close to 100 UN Security Council resolutions uh, condemning Israel. But nevertheless, uh, since 1967, the US has been very careful uh, to, to try and ensure that every such resolution is, is vetoed. The, the US uh, uh, provides Israel with diplomatic uh, and political protection. And of course, Israel uh, pays back. Israel is, in a sense, a, um, a, a US bull, bulldog uh, in the Middle East. Um, carries out a number of uh, uh, wishes of the United States in that region and um, carries out uh, security and military operations for the U.S. that even the U.S. wouldn't do because it would be illegal for it. But apart from the United States, 
um, who are the others that enable Israel's apartheid? Well, if you look at Russia, um, Russia is, is very much part of that process as well. Um, look at the Arab states. And in the past uh, year or so, we've, we've seen a number of uh, so-called normalization uh, deals being made. You have Israel, you have Jordan, which have, um, which have uh, uh, official diplomatic relations uh, with Israel. Now the United Arab Emirates, which goes um, overboard to make, it, uh, make itself look pro-Israeli. Um, the Saudis don't have uh, official dim diplomatic links, but for long their links have been normalized uh, with Israel, etc. Virtually every Arab country um, has good relations uh, with Israel at the moment, including the most recent uh, two African countries, Morocco and Sudan. Um, talking about African countries, um, Israel has worked extremely hard, uh, particularly since 1971, when it looked like um, Africa was becoming more and more critical of Israel, worked very hard to draw African states into its orbit. And today, um, the fact is that the vast majority of Af African states have very good relations with, uh, with Israel. And when issues around Israel come up in the Security Council uh, or in the United Nations, um, they are not unambiguous uh, on the issue. Um, the relations include uh, uh, diplomatic, political, military, intelligence, security, uh, supply of weapons, supply of uh, policing equipment, uh, etc. And so with all of this uh, um, international support, what is being presented to Palestinians as a solution uh, for their future is a Bantustan. As I said, less than what we had in terms of Bantustans in South Africa, but a Bantustan um, nevertheless is what is being presented. Um, and um, uh, okay, let, let me, uh, Comrade Simpiwe, I think I've uh, gone over my time. Let me stop there. I have a few words to say about uh, international solidarity, but I'll stop there and, and we can pick that up in the discussion. No, thanks. Um, in fact, I wanted to um, allow you a bit of time to just speak about the international solidarity um, uh, movement and uh, its support to the fight against, uh, you know, the colonialism in, uh, in the Palestine. So if you can just continue and give us that context before we engage. Okay, um, uh, let me try and do this uh, quickly. Um, you know, I, I attended a, uh, an event in Kailicha two, three days ago. And uh, one of the comrades there said, you know, what is the, uh, we have our own issues here. Why should we be worried about uh, solidarity and uh, assisting someone that's so far away? And it brought to my mind the words of uh, Samora Machel. Um, he said, international solidarity is not an act of charity. I think this is critically important. It is an act of unity between allies fight, fighting on different terrains towards the same objectives. And in the past two weeks, uh, one of the most powerful statements, sorry, that, that's, that's the quote. Um, I'll come back to, to Michelle's quote, but my words that in the, in the past two weeks, one of the most powerful statements that came out in South Africa in support of, of the Palestinian resistance was from uh, Abbaslali Basem Jondolo. Um, the headline of that statement was, the blood of Palestinians is our blood. Um, and I think that this is what Samara Michelle is talking about. He, he goes on to say, Solidarity is an assertion that no people is alone. No people is isolated in the struggle for progress. Solidarity is a conscious alliance of the progressive and peace-loving revolutionary forces in the common struggle against colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism. In short, against exploitation of human by human. Unlike uh, many comrades in the North who see solidarity as a kind of um, assisting the disadvantaged, uh, kind of aid and charity, for us, solidarity is not about that. For us, solidarity is about strengthening ourselves by strengthening um, uh, um, uh, uh, our, our feelings towards others that are in the same position. So in terms of uh, global solidarity, in 2005, Palestinians issued a global call for boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. Um, that call is uh, has been taken up in South Africa. Nazim is part of the convening committee for the South African BDS Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Coalition, uh, which includes uh, a number of solidarity organizations, um, works with a number of trade unions, etc. The most recent of this kind of cooperation was in Durban 
um, last, um, not the Friday past, but the Friday before that, where um, comrades from Kosatu, Saftu, um, and some other unions came together to protest against the docking of a ship owned by Zim Lines in Durban. Zim Lines is an Israeli uh, state-owned shipping company, the, the 10th largest shipping company in the world. And one of the things that also happened as a result of that docking is that leading up to that, there was a discussion that opened up between comrades in Durban and comrades in Oakland in, uh, in California in the US, where over the past two weeks, uh, comrades in o Oakland have stopped two Zim Lines ships from docking in a campaign called Block the Boat. Um, and so comrades in Durban, uh, including the, 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 the unionists there, um, are collaborating now with those in Oakland and building a global campaign against Zimline's uh, shipping company. The objective being to ensure that as uh, wherever in the world it might be possible um, that Zimline should not be able to dock. But of course, more than that, that Durban Harbor and other harbors in South Africa should not allow uh, imports from Israel to come in. I think that this uh, is a huge, uh, um, could be a huge victory if this succeeds. And of course, um, there's the issue of boycotts, which all of us should be involved in. Um, again, one of the campaigns around this that is that is now being led by a trade union uh, uh, by a trade union in collaboration with the uh, with the South African BDS co uh, coalition is the case of Clover. Um, I, I'm sure we all know Clover. We've all bought Clover products, drunk Clover milk, ate uh, Clover yogurt. Clover is an iconic um, South African company from before I was born. Um, has now been bought over by an Israeli consortium. Um, and so Giusa, the trade union that organizes in Clover is calling for a boycott of Clover products. Um, and in fact, I mean, this is a great example of the trade union leading the solidarity movement, not the other way around. Um, and so this is now becoming the big uh, boycott of the day. And certainly any of us that think that we are uh, in support of the Palestinian struggle, this is certainly the, the immediate thing and the easiest thing for us to be able to do. But the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement and, and the boycott, divestment, and, uh, divestment and, and sanctions campaign is one that we as South Africans uh, need to latch onto um, and, and be part of. And of course, it's not just about boycotts and it's not just about stopping ships. It's about forcing our government to implement sanctions on the Israeli apartheid state. Our foreign minister, uh, Naledi Pando, said just about a week ago in parliament, um, she basically issued a call for sanctions. It, it's great. It's, it's new. So the South African government has never done this, but she is the minister of foreign affairs. Um, it's good to call for sanctions, but you are the government. We expect that you would lead the world in implementing sanctions. And so this is also the role that we have to play in forcing our government to take that route um, and, and to mobilize other countries of the global south to pursue this path in support of the Palestinian people. And apart from BDS, of course, our duty as solidarity activists is to support the Palestinian resistance, the, their right to resist and the forms of resistance that they decide on. Um, and, and whatever those forms might be, um, we support those forms of resistance, as I said earlier on uh, in the past month, in those four different fronts within Palestine. Thanks, Comrade Sim uh, Simpira. Thank you, and I think uh, that was really helpful in terms of understanding the background and uh, all issues you know, related to the struggle in Palestine. And of interest is um, you know, the fact that people need to know uh, that you know, everything started with the um, what you know, the so-called uh, you know Basel Declaration or Basel Program, which uh, you know had intentions of uh, you know relocating all Jews into the Palestinian land because that is the Palestinian land, and um, now we're dealing with the effects of the 1976 uh, or 1917 Balfour Declaration, which basically recognized. Uh, you know, pockets of the Palestinian land to be belonging to the Jewish state. And, uh, you know, finally, they, they indicated that, um, you know, um, the Jewish people can occupy Palestine for so long as they don't trample on the rights 
of the you know Palestinian community or the so-called um, you know what they call the non-Jewish community. You know, you don't trample on their rights. You don't trample on their uh, you know political rights to to govern themselves. You know, quite quite interesting. You know, very typical of a setup of a a bandstein as you call it. And um, what is also interesting in all of this is the role of the Arab League or the the you know, the, the Arab community, um, you know, with them, you know, wanting normalization of relations with Israel. Is it is it a question of the Arab League not accepting, uh, you know, the 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 right of the Palestinian uh, people to self determination? Is it a question of the Arab League not accepting that the Palestinian land belongs to, to Palestine? Why is it that um, you know the Arab League is is asking for normalization of of of, of relations between uh, you know <clears throat> the Arab countries and and Israel? And and I think linked to that, uh, why is it that the so-called quartet seems to be content with the occupation of um, you know, Palestinian land by the Israelis. If you can help us unpack that, uh, Nassim, I think it would uh, really help us as we move forward with the, with the discussion. Thanks, uh, uh, Comrade Shefti. I think that is more suitable for Naeem uh, in terms of, 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 of the space he works in. But clearly, I think the, the leadership of the Arab states have been co-opted uh, uh, into Zionism and into capital. Um, and that is why they, they pursue these um, uh, 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 motions to, to try and create normalization, which is actually a sellout of the of the struggle of the Palestinian people. But we also know that many of them are committing their own atrocities. And we know that, for example, that Saudi Arabia has been bombing Yemen for the past three years uh, uh, in very much the same way that that, that we saw uh, Gaza being bombed uh, um, over the last week and, and for decades as well. So so there is this allegiance between the rulers of the Arab world uh, with, with the United States uh, and uh, with the whole New Deal that, that Trump was trying to push and the normalization. I think that uh, Palestinian people have realized that they are on their own. But I want to also say that while we have this, this and, and, and the quartet, the, the Europeans, uh, they've, they've never been honest brokers in, in, in the struggle against colonialism uh, because they are interests and vested interests and alliances that they have with the Zionist state. But just to go back and speak on what Naeem was saying, there's a lot of positive that has come out of the solidarity movement. Um, I don't know if I should take it now because I really want to hear Naeem's input on, 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 the, on this whole issue of normalization. But mm. what, what we are seeing is this allegiance between solidarity activists. I mean, the Black Lives Movement in the United States, in the UK, has come out openly supporting the Palestinian uh, struggle for liberation, understanding uh, and fully identifying with the violence that they experience from the police and the military and the Israeli occupation forces uh, and what, what Black people experience on a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, basis and all, all across the globe. They also identify that their struggles may be different and historically as well. Um, but you cannot be progressive. You cannot be progressive on the rights of, of uh, African Americans and exclude Palestine. If you are progressive, it cannot be with the exception of Palestine. And we see a lot of people willing to speak about uh, climate change and, and being progressive on, on a whole range of issues, but then they become silent on Palestine. And, and a lot of that has to do with the kind of pressure that the Zionist movement puts on people and they hide behind this uh, claim that anyone that, uh, that, that, that challenges Zionism must be anti-Semitic. I can't see the, 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 the link between people who are anti-racist by the entire nature uh, and experience uh, uh, being accused of being anti-Semitic because anti-racism by its nature means that, 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 that you believe in, in, in the equality of all people uh, and not to discriminate against any particular people. But the moment you speak on Palestine, the moment you speak on the rights of the Palestinian, uh, especially if you are someone who has some sort of street cred or some sort of fame, they, then you get attacked. And so people are silent on Palestine. 
the good thing is there's a young generation of people that have emerged. And, and Naeem, we saw this in the protest over the last two weeks. They are determined, they are, are, are articulate, they are, are, are willing to make the necessary sacrifices. They want to grow, they want education programs like the one that you are offering today, so that we can take the struggle uh, to a new level of solidarity. Uh, and that's what we are. We, we provide solidarity to, to, to the people of Palestine. We want more people-to-people -people solidarity, to people to know each other and, and, and share their common experiences. Unfortunately, the powers that be, uh, of, of, of the Arab states are totally in, uh, in cahoots with the, with the Israeli state and with American capital. And I believe that because I do, do think the is a better uh, place to speak to the whole issue of normalization. Mm, mm, mm. No, thanks for that. And uh, Naim, you would remember in when, uh, 2006 when Hamas won the, the elections, um, you know, for them to get support, international support from, you know, the U.S. and uh, the so-called, uh, you know, quartet of uh, U.S., Russia, the EU, and the United Nations, you know, it, it, it was um, conditional upon them accepting uh, Israel um, as, as a neighbor and in, in a bid to support the two the two-state solution. Um, is, is, is that really the solution to the problems of Palestine? Can the Palestinian people not fight for their own state, a one-state solution? Is a one-state solution possible in this conflict? Well, first, let me say, Comrade Simpiwa, that uh, the quartet is really uh, quite irrelevant uh, now. Um, it's, you know, if events have overtaken it. Um, the, the notion that uh, the quartet is any kind of reference point, um, no one really believes that, no one really accepts it. Uh, I don't think the members of the quartet even uh, believe that anymore. But on the question yeah. that, that, you, that you're asking, um, the, the point is that uh, a two-state solution is not possible. Um, even before talking about a one-state solution, um, there's no possibility of a two-state solution in which you have a Palestinian state that is viable, that is sovereign. Um, you know, one might question whether that ever was possible, um, but uh, certainly at this point in time, Israel has made sure that it is not possible, that there's no possibility of such a thing. Mm -hmm. and, so the, and, and the reality also is that you have this territory from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, which was British mandate Palestine, um, and this entire territory is completely controlled by one state, by, by the Israeli state. So in, in, in part of it, it might have some semblance of democracy. In part of it, it might have uh, uh, um, an, an, an apartheid kind of uh, uh, system. In part of it, it's, uh, it's, it's an occupation where it has troops on the ground. In part of it, it, might, it might, it's an occupation where the territory is besieged. But the reality is that it is Israel that controls that whole territory. It is, in effect, already a one-state solution. And uh, in, in a sense, you know, think back to South Africa, let's say in the mid-80s. Mid um, yeah. Was South Africa five states or ten states? No, it was one state. The Bantustans were all, you know, they you know, had a, a so-called government or whatever. But it was just one state. And that's what you have mm -hmm. there. So there's no two-state possibility. The only viable possibility that could point towards a just solution um, is a single state where everyone has equal rights um, and everyone is treated equally and, and, mm. and it's a, a, a democratic state. So is that what the Palestinian uh, you know, fighters are fighting for? Because I mean, right now you have uh, you know, the Palestinian uh, unity government of uh, the Fatah and, and the Hamas. Is, is that what uh, the Palestinian uh, you know, revolutionaries are fighting for now? Uh, that uh, instead of the two-state solution, we would rather have uh, you know, the Israeli and the Palestinians uh, occupying the same space and living together like we are living here in Nazania? Um, so, you, of course, you don't, you, we don't have a, a unity government between uh, Fatah and Hamas. We have the West Bank, where the so-called government is, uh, well, he's not even Fatah. It's uh, Mahmoud Abbas and those that he has selected. Um, and you have Gaza, which is under siege, 
um, where the so-called government is uh, run by Hamas. I say so-called government because we expect that government means there's some level of sovereignty. Neither of these yeah. two have yeah. any sovereignty. But um, I, I, I should say, Comrade Simpiwe, that I think that this is one of the um, one of the weaknesses in terms of the Palestinian narrative that Palestinians have not come out in a united way to say that uh, we want a, um, to, to, to impose our slogan on them just for a moment, uh, that, that we want a, um, a, a united democratic non-racist non, uh, or anti-racist uh, Palestine. Yeah. Um, that, mm. that isn't a clear articulation from their side. And I think that that confuses uh, people around the world in, in, in the solidarity movement. But essentially, um, essentially, you can find uh, maybe half a dozen Palestinians who believe that a two state solution is possible. Uh, mm. Otherwise, Palestinians don't believe that. Yeah, yeah. We are in conversation with Nazim Adam and Nahim Jena on the uh, issue of Palestine and uh, the Real question is about whether it is possible for you know the Palestinian community to reconquer their land. Um, you're more than welcome to engage with us uh, via you know the Q and A, uh, and you can also raise your your hand and to make your contribution in questions. And we welcome your interaction in this uh, in this discussion. Um, <clears throat> A lot of people looked at uh, you know the bombings that were happening in the last couple of weeks and saw the Israelis uh, attacking um, you know civilians and um, you know they were saying that a lot of these properties were housing Hamas bases. Uh, surely that is against uh, you know international norms and, and practices. Why are we seeing this, and why is the so-called uh, international community? And in this case, I would assume international community being, uh, you know, the USA and 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 England, and everybody else is just quiet on this. Why is there nobody commenting and not, nobody declaring that being, uh, you know, against uh, humanity? Eh, Nazim. Well, I think it's because of uh, the fact that, uh, like I said earlier people, anyone that, that challenges what Israel does is immediately labeled as anti-Semitic and no one wants to have that, but also because they have a very strong lobby um, and uh, particularly in America. So you cannot become an American president if you are not in, um, in the good books of the uh, of, of APAC and, and the Zionist uh, movement in, in America. Besides that, I mean, how and and it is the, it's the question of the day is it uh, how do you justify killing 66 children uh by 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 mass bombing by even if it's precise bombing if you are so precise how is it that children and and close to 500 people are killed within a week um from your bombing no, all of those, all of those civilians. Uh, I, I, there's no Hamas soldier that's name has come up, but I've seen 66 names of babies and children uh, that were bombed in all of this. And this has shown be on on social media and and on on progressive uh, uh, media, uh, and this has then changed the the, the 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 opinion that people have of Israel just to see the truth of what they are doing. Um, and saying that you bomb a media building because it's housing Hamas is, is blatant lies. Because It's because that media building is exposing you for the horrors that you inflict on ordinary people just because you because they are they are Palestinian. Um, the and and, and 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 that is something we're always saying that is there a possibility for a South African solution to to Palestine? I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if if two state. I, well, I do know two states is not going to work because of what is what is existing on the ground. Uh, but the Palestinian people will have to come up with a solution. Um, the the unique experiences of, we were never bombed as South Africans the way Palestinians are bombed from the sky, uh, where entire families buildings are destroyed. Uh, with housing people. So the, the solution will have to come from the Palestinian people. One of the things that they are saying is that there is a growing solidarity movement on the ground. 
two is an increasing isolation of the of the Israeli state through boycotts, divestment, sanctions, the amazing work that's being done by the dock workers in South Africa, in Oakland, and that's going to spread, hopefully. Uh, ordinary citizens saying to you that I'm going to read the label, whether it's global or whatever, my home, my kitchen, my fridge is going to be an apartheid-free zone. Uh, and that is also the message we are taking and we've taken in our marches over the last two weeks to the government. So we went to the Gauteng legislature, we, uh, we've been to, to the African National Congress, we've presented memorandums there. Yesterday in Germiston, a group of comrades presented and we're going to take it to every province and ev every premier and, and, and we've taken it to Turco as well. And we're saying to them, South Africa needs and our government needs to be an apartheid free zone. You can no longer be trading with Israel. You need to break all diplomatic uh, ties with the apartheid state. Uh, there's no way that you can see Israel and the Palestinians as equal as equal sides. This is one of the most mightiest military powers in the world with a clear racist agenda to ethnically cleanse uh, uh, the land of all Palestinians. And you need to take a stand. There is no, no nothing about equal equal sides to this what is what what we see in terms of resistance is actually desperation just to survive just to breathe uh and wow. and, and progressive people are, be, are being alerted to this and this is where our strength is for the first time for the first time ever i think it's new york times yesterday published the faces of all the children killed in gaza this is a major significant movement for the sort of uh change for a for a for a, for a newspaper that would never have done that uh, mm. It's a little bit upsetting because it's a paper that supports Zionism. So it's like uh, we kill you and then we mourn for you. You know, it's, uh, it's, yeah. uh, so there is that 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 kind of concern. But still, it's it's significant shifts that we are seeing because of the pressure that that, that solidarity activists and the Palestinian people, the youth activists in Palestine, the social media activists are doing, and that is where our strength for this movement is going to is going to come from. Uh, uh, as, as, and that's just one part. The other part is obviously the resistance uh, and, and building a, 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 a solid resistance, because if you want change, it's you can only negotiate as equals. And at the moment, we're not there. The Palestinian Authority is so desperate to hold on to power that they are even arresting people, uh, legitimate activists on the ground, because they fear that that may turn on them because of the, the, the sellout and the, the, the creating of their own little power base with no power for and no change and just a worsening of conditions for Palestinians on the ground. So the P Palestinian Authority uh, uh, of Mahmoud Abbas is fearful as well. Um, I just want to say that we haven't also seen the kind of open racist uh, bigoted mass attacks on people just because they are Palestinian, uh, as we saw in the last week. And this is a huge indictment on Zionism. Besides the laws, its own people, its uh, Israelis, Israeli Jews are now being uh, aligning with uh, white supremacists and following the kind of actions that white supremacists do, going in mass uh, uh, marches in the middle of, of cities, marking doors which uh, where Palestinians live, uh, pulling Palestinians out of their cars, beating them up, this kind of lynching in, in the public space is, is just clear, more and more clear evidence that the time for, uh, uh, that there's no space in this world anymore for, for us to tolerate this kind of racism and the apartheid state. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Nassim. Uh, here's uh, Yusuf wanting to uh, make a contribution. Uh, thank you. Thank you, comrade. Um, yeah, I've seen the statement of uh, Azapo and the BCM United. Uh, and uh, that was early in, in this latest um, bombings. Um, but I, I once had a discussion with Arun Patel. And he said to me, you know what? And this was now 90 alert. Uh, 90, around about 1990, maybe, or even earlier. Uh, and he said to me, we need, at that time, we were fighting apartheid. And he said to me, you know what, we need articulate people. We need people to be able to speak out. And, and I commend uh, the Zapo people and, and, and well, Zapo and, and uh, the BCM United to have come out with their statements earlier on, early on. But the issue here, that I want to address is, is education. 
education on the issues. So, and, 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 and we're speaking about it and there's many people speaking about it and there are lots of, of, of there's lots of material, there's lots of uh, courses and so on. Um, the issue of Palestine one, and secondly, also um, the issue of English literacy together with uh, African languages, right? Uh, that kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, mix there. We need to look at very carefully as, as a solidarity movement to say, how are we going to educate our people to be articulate on these issues and to stand with one voice as, as we said, one Azania, one nation, and now we're saying one Palestine, one nation. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Um, Naim, you want to comment on that? Uh, no, Simbi, I think the uh, Yusuf's comment is appreciated. Thanks, Yusuf. All right. Um, there's uh, John Trimble. Um, let me just allow him to speak. Uh, Professor Trimble, welcome and uh, make your contribution. I want to thank you for having this. Uh, very important political education program. I think it's uh, essential that we not only support the Palestinian cause, but that we uh, have more of a united force opposed to Zionism. Um, my concern is that this increased uh, polarization that we're seeing, uh, I'm glad that my Conrad pointed that out in terms of parallel and that to uh, the racism that we see in terms of the rise uh, under Trump. Uh, but uh, my question is, in terms of the future, what does this speak to the demographics with regards to uh, occupied Palestine? Because we see with this intensification of struggle uh, an outmigration of a section of the Jewish population. And at the same time, if we track the demographics over the last 20 years, we see a rise in the percentage of non-Jewish population in, in Israel and even uh, uh, the Palestinian population in the occupied areas. So what does this speak to the inevitable future of, of Palestinian victory? Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Trimble. Uh, Reverend uh, Manning. Thank you very much, comrades, and thank you for a very uh, interesting and helpful um, exchange today. I have a question which has two parts. One, as a Christian and a Christian minister, very often up against the confusion that there is in the minds of Christians, that the Israel that we are referring to is the Israel of the biblical tradition, the covenant people. And so emotionally, there's a feeling of we can't oppose these people and we know about the judge recently who went down that road as well. Uh, so uh, is it not possible that we can stop using, even though that's the international name of that particular country, but can actually refer to the state of Zion because it is a Zionist state. And then secondly, with this issue of anti-Semitism, as far as I know, uh, the Palestinians are also a Semite group. Why should they be paying right, for Nazism and anti-Semitism, which happened in Europe by mm -hmm. sacrificing the country of Palestine? And can we bring into the narrative the fact right, that uh, it is Israel, or the state of Israel, or the Zionist state, which is actually being anti-Semitic anti against a group which is Palestinian and who's been there, as you said, for centuries. There's more like a, a U.S. chocolate cake. <laughs> so now we're from chocolate cake. All right. Um, thanks, uh, Reverend Manning, uh, Nazim, uh, Naim. Maybe we start with Nazim and then uh, Naim. Okay, so I think all very valid. I want to just say uh, to to uh, Yusuf that uh, as the BDS coalition. Um, uh, we, we actually established amongst solidarity organizations, there's about 13 solidarity groups in South Africa, and we're also building this network with, uh, uh, with people like Zappo and progressives across the, the spectrum. 
uh, one of the key things that we are looking at is establishing a very uh, strategic educational program, uh, especially uh, now that things have been heated. We, we know lots of people want information at different levels. And uh, so, so that is one of the things that's on the cards for the SAPDS coalition. I, I hear what uh, Comrade John is saying about the, the demographics, and, and we know that there's been a systematic influx of settlers. Uh, the Zionist movements uh, uh, actually advertise and promote for Alia, for, for Jews across the globe to move to, to Palestine uh, and, and occupy territories. There's huge incentives, uh, tax uh, incentives, free land for them, uh, all the support that they need. Uh, uh, just to look at the at, 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 at the water distribution in in the occupied West Bank between settler colonies and 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 uh, indigenous Palestinian uh, farmlands is is a case of why they they are moving towards uh, Judaizing um, uh, Palestine and changing the demographics on the ground. It is also one of the reasons why Palestinians say that. Uh, they, they don't just want peace for the sake of peace, they want a just peace. And one of the, 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 the fundamental rights that Palestinian people are holding very dear to is the right of return. That there are uh, six million plus Palestinians who are living as refugees in different parts uh, uh, of Palestine, that they must have the right to return to their homes and to their villages. Um, from which they were expelled since 1948. So their right of return is, is a critical thing. And then also that under international law, settlers are illegal. They, are not, they, they, they don't have that, that particular right there. But it's about articulating and, 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 and working a very strong case for, for, for that right of return uh, to be a fundamental right, just like democracy and human rights uh, generally are. Uh, the right of return of the Palestinian people is critical in, 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 in finding a solution, because without that, um, and land, re, uh, land uh, reclaiming of the land, uh, is is uh, we're not going to have that kind of just peace. I I hear uh, with uh, Bishop Manning in terms of of the mythical uh, um, uh, arguments from Christian Zionists in particular, but Zionists in general uh, around uh, the uh, the justification for them having a right over uh, other people's land. I I think for me. Um, the answer is simple, let's look what's happening in front of us. Um, and what's happening in front of us cannot be Christian. You cannot uh, forcibly uh, remove people from their homes. You cannot uh, rush into a mosque with tear gas. So you need to look at religion in its con entirety and its context. Um, and I think it's, it's Ronnie Kessel who, who in today's Sunday Times argues that uh, we cannot reduce God to an estate agent. It's not uh, there to, uh, it's not a real estate agent, you know. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, something that is actually uh, against the faith. Uh, and what is stronger is the human values and, and principles that under, underline the center of all religions. And, and we have to open our eyes and see what's happening right in front of us. Who are the people that are committing these atrocities and who are the victims, who are the oppressed? And from my limited understanding is that uh, God is on the side of the oppressed uh, and, and on justice. Uh, and that is what we need to portray. The Kairos um, uh, uh, group of, uh, have, have issued a fantastic uh, statement on, on Palestine. I think it was last year. And, and, and that gives a clear argument in terms of uh, uh, the rights of the Palestinian people, the indigenous people of Palestine to, to their homeland. Um, but you're right in terms of language, and, and we've been alerted to so many things around language, especially in this latest conflict. Uh, and I made that mistake, and I called it a conflict. It's not. It's it's a it's a freedom struggle. It's it's not equal sides. Conflict gives the idea of an equal side. So when we talk of the Zionist state, uh, when we refer to Israel, it's not Israel of the biblical times. It's Israel as it has been usurped by the Zionists to be a racist apartheid state, which, by the way, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, people like uh, John Dugard in, and, and many, many uh, people, even the South African Human Rights Council have declared that Israel is an apartheid state and even worse than that. So um, let's also not forget that 
Britain in all of this, uh, it was the occupying colonial force. And they actually the midwife that gave birth to this apartheid state. They created this. So names spoke about the first half of the 19th century before the United Nations was even born. And while Palestine was under British mandate, they were facilitating the transfer of Jewish people into Palestine to create the democratic shift. Uh, but even by 1948, they were less than, than what, 20% or 30% of the population 30%. and only own 7% of the land, you know? So, so they, this is a continuous colonial project and it links our struggles in so many ways as, as, uh, as, as, as people still dealing with the remnants of, of a post-colonial uh, world uh, in our own spaces. Uh, thank you, Nazim. You want to comment? Zimbira, I'm, I'm not sure if I misunderstood uh, John Trumbull's uh, concern. Uh, is, uh, is, was he saying that we should be concerned about the out-migration, as he called it, uh, of Jews and the increase in the number of non-Jews? I think the, the, the real issue is that uh, the, the, is the Palestinian uh, people are being taken out of their own country. And uh, you see more and more uh, occupation of the land and the space uh, that should be belonging to Palestinians taken over by Israel. Uh, can I Israel. clarify my point? Yeah? I say, can I clarify my point? Uh, come in, John. Yeah, yes. What, what I was speaking to is I feel that the Palestinian struggle, if we look at demographics, it, the, the victory is inevitable. Because, I mean, it, in fact, uh, the migration of, of Zionist Jews has sort of reached a peak, you know, with the initial migrations in, after 48 and then after the demise of the Soviet Union, those that came from uh, Russia and, uh, and Eastern Europe. So that we see that the, the Jewish population that's in support of Zionism, largely in the U.S., has no no desire to move to, to Israel because they don't want to live in a conflict zone. And in fact, what yeah. we see, we see out migration of many of the educated Jews that support Zionism from Israel. So that what I, what I was speaking to was that, that I think it's important for us to recognize the demographics and to use this as a propaganda tool to, to really speak to the inevitable victory of Palestine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I, I understood. Uh, sorry, I, I misunderstood earlier, uh, John. I, I understand what you, uh, what your point is, and I think Nazim um, uh, did respond to that. Let me just add a, a word or two that, of course, you know, we have uh, in 1948, 750,000 Palestinians being made into refugees, uh, most of whom live in uh, the countries around in really squalid conditions. Uh, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Syria, although, you know, many of those in Syria have been um, killed in the civil war there, as well as uh, refugees who live in uh, Gaza and, uh, and, and the West Bank. Um, those refugees now with their descendants number about six to seven million. Um, they have the right to return. But Israel has two very important laws from 1948 and 1950. One is the law of return which grants uh, the right to return to any Jew anywhere around the world, irrespective, yeah. of, uh, uh, irrespective of whether they have any link to Palestine or not. And let me just be clear, the vast majority of Israeli Jews have no lineage ring, link uh, to the land of Palestine. Uh, and the, the absentee property law, which uh, is a way in which citizenship is manipulated and uh, property and land of Palestinians taken away um, for the benefit of uh, immigrant uh, Jews. So, um, so, so they certainly, you know, and, and of course, regard the, the growth of the Palestinian population as a demographic threat. I mean, within Israel, this is normal discourse, academic discourse even, uh, the demogra demographic threat posed by Palestinians and a whole discussion about how to ensure that Palestinian numbers are kept small uh, so that they don't become a majority. I mean, can you imagine if we had such a discussion about white people in South Africa, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or, or black people or whatever the case might be. Um, on on um, Comrade Basil's uh, comments, um, let, let me just say, uh, um, Basil, I, I don't know that naming it the state of Zion is going to help. We have a Zionist uh, 
church just up north here, which uh, <laughs> you know, which which is not Zionist <laughs> in that sense. So I think certainly the uh, the language and terminology is an issue, but uh, we need to find other ways of doing it. But let me say this, uh, Basil, that the Kairos document that that Nazim referred to. Um, is an extremely important document and, and certainly an extremely important tool. I mean, in the US, um, uh, pro-Israeli support is today more from the Christian right than it is from, uh, from Zionist Jews. Uh, Donald Trump wasn't elected by, by, uh, by Zionist Jews. He was elected by the Christian right. Um, and, uh, and I think that all of us, um, Christians and non-Christians, uh, who support the Palestinian people um, have not looked carefully enough at the Kairos document, which says that Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory is a sin against humanity. Um, and, and, you know, much stronger language than that as well. Um, so, uh, Basil, I think that this is something we really need to popularize uh, globally, but certainly in the South African context. And in the South African context, I should say that the pro Israeli Christian sentiment we find is increasing. Um, certainly it, uh, it has been kind of there in the mainline churches in the past uh, and is still there at some level, but uh, in the new evangelical churches, it's much stronger, particularly those evangelical churches that are supported by churches in Nigeria, churches in, um, in, in the US, etc. cetera. Um, and we have this Kairos document, which is a document drawn up and endorsed by all the Christian churches in Palestine um, as, 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 a, as, as a tool to use and we're not using it. And um, you know, the, the role of, Palestinian, of Christian Palestinians in the struggle is extremely strong. I mean, the, uh, after the invasion of Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, two, three weeks ago, there was a call from, uh, from Palestinian Christian priests for Christians to come out uh, to the, the mosque of Aqsa uh, in order to protect it. Um, as Palestinians, they regarded the Al-Aqsa mosque as, as a place of worship that belonged to them because they were, they were mm. Palestinians. Just as Palestinian Muslims regard uh, the Church of the Holy, Holy Sepulcher as being one of their places of worship because they're Palestinians. Um, and I think, uh, Basil, that we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, uh, done enough about this and, and, and I think that the danger of that we're seeing in South Africa with the rise of, uh, you know, the, the ACDP, the ACDP is more Zionist than the DA is, uh, frankly, the African Christian Democratic Party, uh, as well mm. as a number of other Christian groups. And, and we really need to be careful of this and develop um, strategies of how to deal with it, Basil. Yeah. Nervous? Uh, thank you, Comrade Simpiwe. And I wanted to thank uh, the comrades, Comrade uh, Naim and uh, Comrade Nazim, for the clarity with which they've, uh, you know, put forth, you know, uh, the, the, the struggle in Palestine. But I, I, I see that a, it has not come to the fore and I'm seeing that the program is coming to an end. And I think I need to grab this opportunity just to place on record and reiterate that a Azapo from the time of uh, Steve Biko have always been clear about where it stands about the struggle in Palestine. Azapo is clear that they know to state solution will be a solution. Azapo is very clear that that land is the land of the Palestinian people. Azapo is very clear, therefore, that the struggle there uh, is essentially and principally about land repossession. Because with the loss of the land, the people of Palestine lost their dignity. The people of Palestine lost their being. They lost their blood. They lost their lives with the loss of the land. So therefore, for first and foremost, that struggle, it has to be categorically stated that struggle is about the reconquest of the land. And we don't believe as Azapo that we can expect much from Britain 
Remember, Britain is the country, an imperialist country that has done the same thing wherever it has, it has occupied a foreign land. It did the same thing in Iraq. Today we have uh, Iraq and Kuwait. It did the same thing in uh, uh, India and Pakistan. It did the same thing here in Azania. Wherever it lives, it leaves a mess, taking the peace of the country and giving to its own people. You cannot expect much from the USA, from the Americans. Remember, America today is uh, actually ruled by settlers and they want to impose exactly what they have done they in america where they have out wiped out the you know the native people the indigenous people of america so therefore we as a Zappu, expect that a you will fight zionism the same way we are continuing to fight apartheid in this country we also expect that a the in, in, in Palestine, we would want to see Palestinian solidarity. You know, we don't want to see this fragmentation that is happening there. But, but the last one I wanted to say on behalf of us is that we have seen a lot of Palestinian people dying, but we would want to see the struggle being taken to actually where Israel is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nervis. And I think we should be moving towards uh, uh, closure. But as as we move towards uh, closure, Comrade Naim and uh, Nazim, we really need to speak about uh, what needs to be done, you know, by the Solidarity Movement to support the people of Palestine into a coercive force that will really fight for, you know, the land of Palestinians and the reconquest of their land, uh, so that we can see a one a one state solution for. The people of Palestine, and maybe Nazim. Thank you, Comrade uh, The I think that we must first accept that the Palestinian people will determine their own destiny, and their solidarity activists we can support and give our our our, our, our views, but we must mm -hmm. we must uh, respect that. Um, when I speak of the Palestinian people. I think that it, it's speaking about people on the ground, the people that are experiencing the, the fallout of the, the conquest and, and the occupation and, uh, and, and the day-to-day -day kind of struggles that they, they're feeling. So the question in the Q&A was about, can we have a South African kind of solution? I don't know. I, I really don't know at, at this stage. I think that is for Palestinian people to, to rally around and uh, for us to support uh, the Palestinian people uh, in, in, in their fight for justice. What I do know that it's almost impossible for, uh, for two parties who are not equal militarily, uh, economically, <coughs> socially, to be able to, to, to come to the table uh, and, and, and just agree on, 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 on some sort of settlement without, uh, um, without any real justice uh, on the table. What I want to say is that from our side, um, uh, we realize that it is through unity uh, that we can uh, achieve our success. And that is why uh, uh, most of the solidarity organizations have come together under the BDS coalition, uh, which is linked directly to the international BDS movement. And I think this gives us strength. The fact that we could link up the Durban dock workers with the workers in Oakland is giving us that global context of people to people solidarity and action. So while America and Britain in terms of their rulers and those who dominate the, the seats of power, we have no faith and no trust in them. We are seeing amazing, amazing uh, solidarity actions. 150,000, 200,000 people marching in the streets of London, in Chicago, and so forth, uh, all for the Palestinian cause. And people articulating and understanding fully that this that our struggles are linked, uh, whether it's Black Lives Movement in South Africa or the housing, housing crisis people in South Africa, uh, we our struggles are, uh, are interlinked and, and, and we need to make those uh, those links um, uh, with, with, the, with the Palestinian cause. I think that through boycotts, divestments and sanctions, we as solidarity activists on the outside, we can make a difference. I think linking up with Palestinian people uh, and giving them strength and, and, and support is, is in, in whatever way possible is, is important. Um, I think that 
holding our government accountable to the values that, uh, that, that we have struggled for, for freedom, justice, equality, that is critical. And moving and pushing uh, for legislation so to sanction apartheid Israel, to make it illegal to trade with apartheid Israel. This is something that we have to work with. You know, in the, in the Clover boycott, we worked with Giusa from the start, Naim was there as well. We were challenging the South African, uh, what was that, competitions board to say that you can't only decide whether an investment is good based on some economic predictions. You have to also look at the companies investing in our country and their human rights record and track track record, because that is also important uh, for us in terms of, of workers' rights and, and, and not just workers in South Africa, but across the globe. By the way, Milko, yeah. which is the company that bought over the consortium of, of Clover, they actually op op were, have factories and have taken over farms in occupied Palestine. They are occupiers. And and that is why it makes it totally unjust uh, and, and we should have legislation which makes it illegal for us to, to allow for such companies to operate in South Africa. There's also a huge issue around South African Jews who serve in the Israeli occupation forces and we need to uh, we need to now take those people to court. We need to we need to have our, our uh, we are as South Africa part of the Rome Statute. In 2010, we had taken uh, 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 the Gaza docket to the ICC. Um, they said go back to your South African prosecuting authority. The prosecuting authority set on it. Um, but they've now opened up as the ICC and said they're willing to investigate uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes and the crime of apartheid, which is a huge significant uh, move for us. And so we need to hold these people accountable in these criminal courts. And there's a whole uh, a space where people could do uh, the kind of legal uh, um, uh, work uh, to isolate uh, the protagonists of Zionism, their leaders, their, 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 their generals, and even those ordinary soldiers who go and serve and shoot people uh, uh, and, and, and manage um, checkpoints. Uh, if, if anyone wants to, there's a fantastic movie on Net Netflix called The Present, uh, which you must watch if you want to just see the day-to-day -day relations between Palestinians, ordinary people, and the soldiers at these checkpoints. Please watch it. It's called The Present. I think that uh, we need to uh, also make it clear that uh, our, our spaces that we live and work in uh, and we're governed from become apartheid-free zones. Uh, thanks, Naeem. Um, well, just to add to what uh, Nazim has said, because he has said uh, the bulk of what I might have said if I spoke first, Nazim. Look, to summarize, I mean, I think our, our responsibilities are at two levels. One is BDS, and the mm. second is to support Palestinian resistance. On the first issue, it's of course the boycotts and divestment and sanctions, etc. As Nazim spoke about, uh, putting pressure on on the uh, on our government uh, to move in that direction to build a global uh, uh, a global kind of support base of states uh, that support this kind of position, the similar kind of thing that friendly states did for our struggle uh, in in the past. So it's, it's that, it's the, the BDS uh, campaign together with the pressure on the government, as well as the supporting the Palestinian resistance. And let me say that, uh, you know, in, in the run-up to the ANC conference where they took the resolution on downgrading our embassy, um, our center, the Afro-Middle East Center, did a study about the relations between South Africa and Palestine and, and Israel. And our conclusion actually was that for a range of reasons, um, South Africa as a state and South Africans as people would be better off um, if the relationship with Israel uh, was ended. Uh, morally, ethically, in terms of our constitutional values, but also economically and in terms of our sovereignty and, and security, um, we would be better off if the South African government ended the relations that we have with the Israeli state. And that I think is a big goal uh, for us and a big contribution that we can make to the Palestinian struggle, uh, not only in terms of its direct um, economic and political impact, but also in terms of its uh, moral and symbolic uh, impact for Palestinians and the solidarity movement globally. But whatever forms of, of resistance Palestinians choose, we must be prepared to be behind that and support that. 
Yeah, we can only echo the, those sentiments that, uh, you know, um, that just like our struggle was supported by the international community and uh, during the times of our own uh, cultural boycott and the times of our own uh, struggle, there was a lot of international solidarity and support for our own, um, you know, liberation uh, project. I think it is important that we continue to support the Palestinian struggle and continue to support the Palestinian people towards, uh, you know, retaining uh, their land and towards uh, ob obtaining their own liberation out of, uh, you know, the Israeli occupation. And, uh, you know, by those words, I just want to thank Nazim and uh, Nahim for, you know, very good and great contributions this afternoon. And um, I hope that for everybody connected, the time was well spent and uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you for connecting and uh, goodbye till we meet again next uh, Sunday, same time. Thank you.